Professor Dave here. Let's learn about Harry Truman. He knows a lot about all kinds of stuff. Professor Dave explains. Harry S. Truman succeeded to office after the death of Franklin Roosevelt in the final months of World War II. He ordered the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, prompting the Japanese surrender and the end of the war. He launched the Marshall Plan to rebuild the economy of Western Europe, and he helped set up the United Nations, as well as NATO, in order to counter the Soviet communist threat throughout Eastern Europe. He established the Truman Doctrine and, through the UN, fought communist North Koreans to a stalemate in the Korean War. In domestic affairs, he was a moderate Democrat whose liberal proposals were a continuation of the New Deal, but the conservative-dominated Congress blocked most of them. He used presidential authority to abolish segregation in the military and put civil rights on the national political agenda. Truman was born in Lamar, Missouri, and spent most of his youth on his family's 600-acre farm near Independence. He served in combat in France during World War I as an artillery officer with his National Guard unit. After the war, he briefly owned a haberdashery in Kansas City, Missouri, and then joined the Democratic political machine of Tom Pendergast. Truman was elected U.S. Senator in 1934 and gained national prominence as chairman of the Truman Committee, which exposed waste, fraud, and corruption in federal government wartime contracts. Vice President Henry Wallace was popular among Democratic voters, but he was viewed as too far to the left and friendly to labor for some of the Democratic leaders, who wanted Wallace replaced. Roosevelt told the party leaders that he would accept either Truman or Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. State party leaders preferred Truman, and Roosevelt agreed. Truman's well-received nomination was dubbed the Second Missouri Compromise. In the 1944 election, the Democratic ticket achieved a 432-99 to electoral vote victory over Governor Thomas E. Dewey of New York, and Truman was sworn in as vice president on January 20, 1945. Truman's brief vice presidency was relatively uneventful. Roosevelt rarely contacted him, even on major decisions. The president and vice president met alone together only twice during their time in office. He was uninformed about major initiatives relating to the war and the top-secret Manhattan Project, which was developing the world's first atomic bomb. Truman had been vice president for 82 days when Roosevelt died on April 12, 1945. He received an urgent message to go immediately to the White House, where Eleanor Roosevelt informed him that her husband had died due to a massive cerebral hemorrhage. Truman asked if there was anything that he could do for her, to which she replied, Is there anything we can do for you? You're the one in trouble now. When Truman met with reporters the next day, he famously remarked, Boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. I don't know if you fellas ever had a load of hay fall on you, but when they told me what happened yesterday, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all the planets had fallen on me. Germany surrendered only a few weeks after Truman assumed the presidency, but the war with Japan was expected to last at least another year. In August, the Japanese refused the unconditional surrender the Allied forces demanded, so Truman approved the use of atomic bombs. His rationale was that by using such an overwhelming show of force, it would end the war and spare the hundreds of thousands of American and Japanese lives that would be lost in the planned Japanese invasion, a decision that remains controversial to this day. Many condemn him for what was unquestionably an inhumane act of destruction, which caused countless civilian deaths. Truman's presidency marked a turning point in American foreign affairs. It had emerged from World War II as the world's leading power, and under Truman, it renounced its isolationist past to prevent what it saw as communist aggression in Europe and Asia. As Stalin began reneging on promises he'd made regarding free elections in the Soviet-occupied territories of Eastern Europe, the USSR came to be viewed as the successor to Nazi Germany. In a speech condemning the Soviet occupation, Winston Churchill famously proclaimed, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. This is typically regarded as the opening volley of the Cold War. 
American diplomat George F. Kennan, stationed in Moscow, sent a long telegram to Roosevelt warning of Stalin's designs and his advice urging the United States and its allies to contain the Soviet Union. That containment recommendation became the basis for American foreign policy for much of the Cold War. When the Russians cut off access to West Berlin, Truman oversaw the Berlin Airlift of 1948 and the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, in 1949. This was a security pact between 12 countries intended to offer mutual defense against Soviet threat. An attack on any of these nations would be considered an attack against them all. As part of the Cold War strategy, Truman signed the National Security Act of 1947. This merged the Department of War and the Department of the Navy into the Department of Defense and created the U.S. Air Force. The act also established the CIA, or Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Council, and later the National Security Agency, or NSA. In response to the Cold War threat, the nation descended into paranoia. The present national security state and massive military-industrial complex is an outgrowth of this paranoia engendered by the Cold War, and Truman later regretted the monster he'd created. In a Washington Post editorial in 1963, Truman called for the abolishment of the CIA, writing, For some time I have been disturbed by the way the CIA has been diverted from its original assignment. It has become an operational and at times a policy-making arm of the government. Although Truman rejected Churchill's pleas to overthrow the socialist Iranian government threatening to nationalize the British Petroleum Oil Company, the later Eisenhower administration would have no such qualms, and the CIA was used to overthrow the Mossadi government in 1953, as well as the socialist Guatemalan government in 1954 that wanted to nationalize the United Fruit Company, thus preventing the redistribution of wealth from corporations to citizens. The CIA would later organize a coup in Chile under Richard Nixon on behalf of ITT, a large Nixon contributor. In drumming up support for his ambitious Marshall Plan to rebuild war-devastated Europe, Truman may have unintentionally caused some of the anti-communist paranoia. Many Republicans were opposed to the massive multi-billion dollar package, and in order to win their support, Truman had to present the program as a form of national security, a barricade against the Soviet menace. Senator Arthur Vandenberg even told Truman to demagogue on this issue, saying, scare the hell out of the American people. His plan worked, but inadvertently unleashed a red scare, a cultural hysteria that communists were lurking everywhere. The Marshall Plan was one product of what came to be codified as the Truman Doctrine, the idea of aggressively countering Soviet threat with economic and even military power if necessary. This dominated American foreign policy until the collapse of the USSR in the 90s. But there were troubling domestic side effects, like the communist witch hunts of Joseph McCarthy. As the election of 1948 neared, Truman had become quite unpopular due to his handling of the Cold War and a railroad strike the previous year. The Republicans had returned to power in the House in 1946 for the first time since 1930, and they blocked much of his legislation. Moreover, he faced a mutiny by the Southern Dixiecrats over his actions on civil rights, and his renomination at the 1948 Democratic Convention was no sure thing. The Dixiecrats, led by Strom Thurmond, walked out and Thurmond ran for president as a third-party candidate, while former Vice President Henry Wallace revolted on the left and became the nominee of the Progressive Party. Truman and vice presidential pick Albin Barkley, faced with a three-way split among the Democrats, were given little chance in the upcoming election to beat the popular GOP nominee, New York Governor Thomas E. Dewey. Truman embarked on an ambitious whistle-stop campaign, crisscrossing the country by train, railing against the obstruction of the Republicans, and promising a new suite of policies, dubbed the Fair Deal, to succeed and extend FDR's New Deal. Give em hell, Harry, became the unofficial motto as Truman would stop in a town, appear on the caboose, and give a rousing speech denouncing the Republicans, then roll down the tracks to another town and repeat the performance. 
Yet the mainstream press was so certain he would lose that the Chicago Tribune printed its infamous headline, Dewey Defeats Truman, before the votes had even been fully counted. Truman's victory remains the most stunning comeback in American political history. Truman's second term would be almost as dramatic as his first. A new wave of anti-communist hysteria gripped America when Mao Zedong's communists took over China and the Russians detonated their first nuclear weapon, both in 1949. When communist North Korea invaded South Korea in 1950, Truman sought United Nations approval for UN forces to fight the Korean aggression. After initial successes in Korea, the communist Chinese intervened and threw the UN forces back, resulting in a stalemate throughout the final years of Truman's presidency. General Douglas MacArthur, legendary hero of World War II, advocated attacking Chinese supply bases, which Truman rejected, concerned that further escalation of the war might lead to open conflict with the Soviet Union, which was using North Korea as a proxy, supplying weapons and jets. MacArthur then went behind Truman's back and promoted his plan to Republican House leader Joseph Martin, who leaked it to the press. Furious, Truman fired MacArthur from his commands. MacArthur's dismissal was among the least popular decisions in presidential history, and Truman's approval plummeted. As he faced calls for his impeachment, MacArthur returned home to a hero's welcome and addressed a joint session of Congress, a speech that the president called a bunch of damn bullshit. Truman's approval rating fell to 22% in 1952, which was, until George W. Bush in 2008, the all-time lowest approval mark for an active American president. Years later, Truman defended his action by stating, I fired him because he wouldn't respect the authority of the president. I didn't fire him because he was a dumb son of a bitch, although he was, but that's not against the law for generals. If it was, half to three quarters of them would be in jail. On domestic issues, Truman's fair deal programs, such as a national health insurance plan, faced opposition from a Congress dominated by Republicans and conservative Southern Democrats, who also opposed Truman's civil rights policies. However, his administration was able to successfully guide the American economy through the post-war economic challenges. Truman maintained that civil rights were a moral priority, and in 1948, he submitted the first comprehensive civil rights legislation, also issuing executive orders to start racial integration in the military and federal agencies. Allegations of corruption by certain cabinet members and senior White House staff became a central campaign issue in the 1952 presidential election and dissuaded the unpopular Truman from seeking another term. Yet not long after leaving office, historians began reevaluating Truman. He is often ranked in the top 10 presidents, and scholars celebrate his decisiveness in times of great international upheaval, his dedication to continuing Roosevelt's New Deal, and his commitment to civil rights. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.